Ospreys kill often and effectively. Mary Ellen tracked the bird with the binoculars as it swooped from the sky, tucked its tainted wings inward, and pointed its head at the Chesapeake. In an unexpected move, it thrust its cutting talons into the water and skimmed the surface. Somewhere below the sunlit waves, an unsuspecting creature was removed instantly from the ocean environs. With something now firmly caught in its clutches, the powerful fish hawk lifted its prey toward the scattered clouds. Mary Ellen Fresco is on her way to Sabin's Island in the Chesapeake. She's bringing her kids over on a sunny summer's day. Traveling with Mary Ellen is a retired policeman from Buffalo named Kel. Kel is a security officer at Hazleton, where Mary Ellen and her husband Tony have brought their kids for the summer at the beach house overlooking Chesapeake Bay. Beach House is a novel about deception and murder, very strange murders. Mary Ellen swings the binoculars from the boat. She looks back at the beach house across the bay. A young bartender named Sue Lee has parked her orange car at the beach house where her husband Tony is painting the house. Her kids are aboard the boat. As the landmass vanishes, she gets nervous. Kel, out of uniform, plays charades with the kids along the deck. Mary Ellen has images of Sue Lee's red string bikini on the beach and her sweeping dark hair, and she wonders what this woman is doing with Tony alone painting the house. Kel adjusts his Baltimore Orioles hat as he moves down the deck. When Mary Ellen brings up the problem across the bay, Kel mentions Sue Lee's attraction to men. He thinks she has a nefarious background, a reputation. Angie, Shane, and Danny have no idea what's going on back at the beach house. Mary Ellen calls the beach house phone but gets no answer. She silently cries as she begins thinking about her wedding day. Later on in the afternoon as she walks her dog, her golden retriever, Eloise, Tony wonders why she has rushed out the door with the dog. He tells her that he's moved all his assets to Binghamton Beach with his broker, Marty. And then he tells her quite bluntly that his afternoon was productive. But Sue Lee was with her husband all afternoon. Your hands are shaking, Tony, says Mary Ellen. Tony claims it's from holding the paintbrush as he painted the beach house. But she tells him straight out that Sue Lee's car was in the driveway and she saw it. Tony hesitates. And then she looks at Tony and thinks if he's involved with this woman, he's a weakened shadow of the man she had married. Later on, she gazes across the moonlit bay. Now she's determined to track down Sue Lee. Kel brings additional information to her the next day. Two older men who dated Sue Lee died under mysterious circumstances. A Roger Tromley was working on his car. He had his Corvette up on ramps when it fell on him. According to Kel, she does like older men. A man named Artie Rankin was washed out to sea, with Sue Lee watching from the bridge overlooking the beach. Now she knows she has to speak frankly with Tony. But something isn't right about this woman. Kel, now in retirement doing his security job, tells Mary Ellen that he's going to find the truth. Tony flies back to his job on the road. Mary Ellen is in bed, staring out the window. It's been weeks since she made love to Tony. It is at that time she smells a strange scent of night sin, perfume worn by Sue Lee. Something smashes the glass downstairs. Tail lights disappear up the road. She runs out to find her dog missing and the garage window broken. She immediately calls Kel. Kel tells her to stay put. He calls the police. They find a piece of granite on the cement. The incident is attributed to young teenagers and the cops say she's just some bartender. Kel later heads back to his trailer, but he's going to track down Sue Lee and solve the case, scoring the big one. Mary Ellen is in the supermarket the next day. She hasn't slept all night. She scrubbed down the entire shower earlier back at the beach house because it smelled of night sin, further implicating Tony. The anxiety from the rock incident has reached a high pitch. She's trapped within her own fear. She sees a woman who looks like Sue Lee, and then she realizes how revved up she is. Tony is at the airport and calls on the phone about the rock. 
Tony says he'll be back on Friday morning. He doesn't know anything about the night sin in the shower. He never gave a proper explanation. The glass guys come to the beach house and fix the window. It's at that time that Mary Ellen finds that somebody has drank her wine. It's down halfway in the bottle. Night sin is still in the air. She washes all the bedclothes and sheets in the washer and quickly dries them. Then she wonders if Sue Lee had keys to the beach house. Kel tells her he's going to investigate Artie Rankin's death. Was Rankin pushed off the jetty overlooking the bay? He finds out that Rankin had walked a lot that summer. Sue Lee's car was parked at Cobb's Bridge overlooking the bay and the jetty when Rankin was killed. He later finds out that Roger Tromley was killed instantly by the Corvette falling on him. Sue Lee was seen around town in the Corvette with Trombley. The Binghamton Beach cops don't like Kel. Just in case Sue Lee has the keys to the house, Mary Ellen gets new locks for the beach house. Kel then makes a call to Tony about Sue Lee. Tony insists he has no relationship with Sue Lee. Then he starts blasting Kel and asks him why the hell he's even involved in this. Kel mentions the murders of two married men. Tony at that time on the phone tells him to mind his own business. He hangs up the phone. Kel brings his compact up the hill to the restaurant where Sue Lee works as a bartender. He thinks back to how he was fired for fingering a young hood who killed a three-year-old kid back in Buffalo. Nobody could prove it, and they said he never had the evidence. It's dark inside the restaurant. Sue Lee is behind the bar. She has well-formed buttocks and wears white shorts and has long dark hair. Her smile is wide and she swishes back her long dark hair. Somehow Sue Lee knows exactly who Kel is. He tries not to stare at her. He finds out she's not from around here. Kel is flooded with carnal thoughts. He accuses her of being over at Tony Fresco's. Through a wave of scented perfume, he brings her outside. She puts out signals of availability and says that Tony is cool. She bends over and gives him a full shot of her breasts. She claims she went over to Tony's to get some software for her brother's roommate. And then she says she wished she had been there all day if she had known the wife was going to be away. She says to him, everyone needs to be naughty once in a while, Mr. Kelly. Mary Ellen needs to keep her man occupied. And she said, I'd die without men. After all these implications, she tells Kel to stop by and have a drink sometime. Kel further questions her about her brother, Ron Lee, in Annapolis. She drops something and then bends over. As Kel is leaving, he sees a chrome dealer logo on the Mustang Cross Brothers Motors but no designation for town or city. Back at the beach house, Mary Ellen's brewing coffee. Kel tells her how Sue Lee was charming and very alluring, but he said she's lying. She did admit to coming over for software as Kel conversed with her in the bar. Eloise is still missing. Mary Ellen wants to know what was it that caused Sue Lee to trap married men. The phone rings inside. Loud jazz music plays in an echoing you voice. You about the night city. You wanted me to get out on the face. You should have left me alone. You should have left me alone. And now you're dead. Now you're dead. You never cared about the night city. You wanted me to get out on the face. You should have left me alone. You should have left me alone. And now you're dead. she cries, it's her. Later on, she can't locate Kel. She's reached her tolerance with Sue Lee. She goes over to the restaurant Barnacle Bills. Mary Ellen is demanding to speak with Sue Lee, but finds out she's taken a few days off. She gets Sue Lee's address, Northgate Condos, Route 16, Condo 42B. She heads out to the condos. Something lurked in Sue Lee's past, triggering her behavior. Out at the condo, there's nobody there. She shouts out, damn you, and punches in Sue Lee's number. She reaches Sue Lee's voicemail and plays back the strange message she had gotten on her phone earlier. Kel arrives at the beach house. At the pool, she tells Kel about this strange message. 
Cal thinks that she's a nutcase. Tromley ran into Sue Lee three years ago in Binghamton Beach. Mrs. Tromley caught them on the beach. They had four kids. His widow swears Sue Lee was involved in the Corvette crashing down on Tromley. His gut feeling is exactly that. Sue Lee did something to those ramps, causing the Corvette to fall on Trombley. But then he asks the question, how do you arrange for ramps to fall on somebody? He tells Mary Ellen to stay the hell away from Ms. Sue Lee. She gets a call from her neighbor back in Tuppersburg, where she and Tony live in Pennsylvania. An orange sports car was in her home driveway. Her neighbor, Sylvia, admits that it was a Mustang and it sat in the driveway for 15 minutes. Kel arrives in his Orioles hat. She tells him about Tuppersburg. Kel then goes down to the police station, but Chief Hawkins will not treat the two men as murder cases and discounts the Mustang being in the Tuppersburg driveway. Mary Ellen waits alone at the airport for Tony to arrive. Hawkins will not bring in Sue Lee. The cops just don't like Kel and discount everything that he says. Cal waits for Sue Lee at the condo, but she doesn't show up. Tony lands at the Binghamton Beach Airport. All the way home, they don't talk about Sue Lee. She doesn't tell him about Tuppersburg. He's announced that he's taking two weeks off to be with them at the beach house. Maybe he and Mary Ellen can get away for a few days. He tells her he never responded to Sue Lee's advances. Out back, he enjoys his family and the kids. He tells Mary Ellen he's going to finish painting the house. He has two weeks to talk about anything. As he answers the phone, the strange message plays again. You never cared about the night scene. You wanted me to get out on the face. You should have left me alone. You should have left me alone. And now you're dead. Now you're dead. You never cared about the night scene. You wanted me to get out on the face. You should have left me alone. You should have left me alone. Now you're dead. 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 Tony goes upstairs. She can hear him yelling into the phone on the third floor, just get the hell out of my life. He tells Mary Ellen again he wasn't involved with Sue Lee. She's crazy. She took off her top and she went in the outside shower. At that time, Mary Ellen tells him about Tuppersburg. Tony insists that he did not make love to that woman. Mary Ellen spends a sleepless night on the third floor away from Tony. She fears that her marriage to Tony is over. She wants to leave the beach house, but before she leaves, she wants to confront Sue Lee. The possibilities of divorce scare her. In six hours, she could be home in Tuppersburg. She spots Sue Lee at the far end of the beach in a bikini. As she approaches, Sue Lee produces a coy smile. Her night sin perfume mixes with the salt sea air. There's fire in her dark eyes as she grabs Mary Ellen, shoves her and then leaves and says, he's mine. Tony appears on the beach. Mary Ellen runs up to him and says, I'm out of here and I'm out of this marriage. Tony in a quite loud voice said, I haven't done anything wrong. She tells Kel that the time has come for her to leave Binghamton Beach. Tony again swears that he never came on to Sue Lee or did any funny stuff. Sue Lee tried to get to him and trying to make him look bad. Kel then finds out additional information. How Sue Lee, nine years ago when she was 14 and another man was 33, he dumped her. He has to track down this guy and find out what happened. Mary Ellen tells Kel that her marriage is over. As Mary Ellen is coming back from the beach, there are police cars in the driveway. One of the police officers comes out and tells Mary Ellen that Tony has had an accident. He fell from the ladder. He's dead. Mary Ellen says immediately, she did it. Kel jogs up the driveway as Mary Ellen screams for Tony. There's nothing wrong with the latter. Mary Ellen says that she should have listened to him. They bring Tony by in a body bag. As Mrs. Blumenthal, the next door neighbor, takes the kids, Kel talks to Hawkins. Kel says that he was right in Buffalo and he's right now. He's certain that Sue Lee killed Tony. 
he confronts Su Li directly. She insists that she didn't kill anybody, that each of the men who died were at their own risks. At the funeral, Mary Ellen is drugged and leaves with her kids for her sister's house in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. Kel goes over to Bradbury's Hardware, discovers two yellow car ramps. He talks to Ronnie, the salesman, about the car ramps. But Sue Lee did not buy car ramps at Bradbury's Hardware. Ronnie smiled and said he went out with Sue Lee a few years ago. It's at that time that Kel finds the name of the banker in New York City, Edward Latrobe, that Sue Lee had an affair with when she was 14 years old. Ronnie tells her that she came to Binghamton Beach with her father and her geek brother. Her father died a few years ago. As the Osprey wings over the bay, Kel begins searching for Latrobe. He finds out from one of the Latrobe children that their father died eight years ago in a hunting accident in Vermont. Now Kel is quite concerned as the Osprey swings out of sight. He wonders if she had prearranged the rocks on the jetty, causing Rankin to fall and get washed into the sea. Kel feels that someone is following him as he takes the ferry up to Delaware. He calls on a Mrs. Bates. Mrs. Bates used to be Mrs. Trombley. She brings him downstairs to look at the ramps that are still in her basement. Kel inspects them but finds out that there's nothing wrong with the ramps. There are no marks at all on the ramps. If a car had collapsed, sending the ramps to the floor, there would have been scratches and possibly dents on the ramps. He's wondering if someone had put a precise cut under another ramp and then ditched that ramp later, substituting the new ramp. As he's moving back up the highway, he has a flat tire. Now he's coming to the conclusion that the ladder, the jetty, and the ramps were sabotaged. He hikes two and a half miles to a payphone because he can't find his own cell phone. When he returns to his car and goes to the trunk, the ramps are gone. Now he's convinced that Sue Lee punctured the tire. At the ferry, Mary Ellen is waiting. Having returned alone from the Berkshires, he wants her out of the area, but she needs to find the truth. He is convinced and he tells her that identical ramps were substituted for the new ramp. Everyone thinks the ramp fell on Trombley, but that's not the case. Maybe she did the same thing with the ladder. Somebody would have to have seen where she bought the ladder. Sue Lee is back at the condo. Now Kel is convinced that the other ladder was placed against the house when Tony went to the beach to see Mary Ellen. The ladder snapped and then Tony was dead as Sue Lee replaced the original ladder. Kel mentions to Mary Ellen that he had 43 years on the force. He talks about his wife Margie, how Margie never made it to Binghamton Beach. He has a son who's in the Peace Corps, and he tells Mary Ellen he doesn't count on Sue Lee making a blatant mistake. She's always thinking. Later, Mary Ellen is on a bed below thinking of Tony. For security reasons, Kel is sleeping on the couch down below. She thinks about her kids safely ensconced at her sister's house in the Berkshires. Suddenly, the glass slider explodes. Kel shouts for Sue Lee, but he can't find anybody outside. She has to have gone back to the condos. Mary Ellen dials 911. The cops are sending out cruisers. Chief Hawkins sends people out to the condos, but Sue Lee is inside her condo and hasn't gone anywhere. Maybe Kel is wrong. Maybe she didn't do it. Kel argues with Hawkins about Sue Lee smashing the ciders, but she was asleep in bed. Hawkins wants Mary Ellen back with the kids in the Berkshires. Kel wants to redeem himself about Buffalo and tells Hawkins that he's wrong. But Hawkins said she never used the car. It was cold. Kel studies his notes. He finds all the hardware stores for ladders. He's looking for an Aberdeen ladder with an orange plaid sticker on the side. As Mary Ellen leaves for the Berkshires, Kel speculates that the ladder must have been dumped in the ocean by Sue Lee. Kel begins tracking down the Cross Brothers Motors logo. He finds it in Hayden, Maryland, and heads three hours up to that city. Near the off-ramp, he scans the area and finds a municipal hardware who do stock Aberdeen ladders. When he mentions Sue Lee, the lady in the store's smile dropped. Her father worked in a machine shop, which is still in the town. She doesn't come back there much, and the brother doesn't come at all. Her father died a year ago. 
but she did come back last weekend to buy an Aberdeen ladder. Now Kel knows, as the lady says how Su Lee went to the technical high school, that her father's warm little house on North Street may contain clues to the murder of Tony Fresco. She may have used the van to haul off a ladder. He approaches the shed in the house that overlooked a fast-running river, sees an array of tools and a central drill and calibrating devices in the shop. She was bold enough and in superb physical condition. He looks down at the cascading river. He has to get a phone call into Hawkins. As he starts the car, there's a glare and a front-end loader. He lifts the Escalade up into the air. Kel hits the roof. The car tilts as Kel rolls back. There's forward movement toward the riverbank. The car careens over the edge and splashes into the river with blood covering his forehead as he passes out. Mary Ellen is thinking of Tony as she tries to sleep. Her sister Kathleen wakes her up. She asks Mary Ellen if she'd like to attend a church picnic later in the day. At that picnic, Danny goes missing at the church carnival, and then all the kids are gone. Mary Ellen is convinced and tells Officer Wazinski that Sue Lee did it. They spend nine and a half hours looking for the kids. She explains to Kathleen about Kel and the latter. Sue Lee knows that Kel and I have figured it out. Wazinski will question everyone at the church picnic. Then she finds a letter on her bed in the Berkshires. Somebody wants a half a million dollars at the beach house before dawn with no cops. Kel is in St. Luke's Hospital after the front end loader incident. He has it figured out, but he doesn't know where he is. He doesn't remember the exact details of the accident, but he does know that Sue Lee did it. He requests the cops come to the hospital. He meets with a detective, Ed Farrell, and tells him about Sue Lee. They tell him that he drove off the embankment and dropped 80 feet into the river. Kel shakes his head and said that Sue Lee was making murder look like an accident. Nobody believes Kel. Now Mary Ellen is convinced that Sue Lee has her kids, and Kel is convinced that Sue Lee tried to kill him. When he gets back to Binghamton Beach, he finds out that Sue Lee all the while was sleeping at her condo. There is no proof, but Kel says that she did it. She bought an Aberdeen ladder up in Haydenville, and that same hardware store up in Haydenville sold the car rents that killed Roger Tromley. Everything was made to look like an accident. Her car was cold again, but what about the maroon van? Then Mary Ellen is missing. He finds out that the van belongs to the son, her brother, Ronald Swan Lee in Annapolis. The van originally belonged to the father. Mary Ellen is alone in the house. They find out that Ronald Lee was given a ticket on the New Jersey Turnpike just yesterday, but the sighting officer did not see any kids in the van. It's at that time she smells night sin, becoming prevalent in the room. Down at the police station, Cal argues with Sue Lee as the cops interrogate her. Mary Ellen hears creaking on the second floor she can't sleep and grabs a wooden pole. The spotlight outside goes out and a slight mist is in the air. Now she needs to call the police, but outside the sliders, an Asian man with a long face and terror in his eyes smashes the patio chair through the sliders. He talks English and says that she'll be brutally murdered. She goes to the upper floor stairway from the bedroom. The guy chases her and grabs her neck. She pulls him down and he flips over the stairs. She staggers to the end table phone and dials 911, but the line isn't working. The man, having survived the fall, rushes to the first floor stairs. Mary Ellen whacks him with the pole and they sprint to the slider. And then he sings out the words to the song that's played as a message on her voicemail so many times. The music player outside is playing the same song. You never cared about the lights. You wanted me to get out of my face. You should have left me alone. You should have left me alone. And now you're dead. Now you're dead. You never cared about the lights. You wanted me to get out of my face. He smiles the smile of a killer about to complete his task. He runs outside and into the waiting pool. Music plays outside. He chants the word. Mary Ellen picks up the music player and throws it in the waiting pool. Sparks fly, and the man is dead. She runs back inside as Kel's security car shows up. The dead man's hair forms wisps in the water. 
Maybe he was just defending his sister. Cal tells her that pipe cutters were used to loosen the upper rungs of Tony's ladder. Just like the ramps, it was switched. But the power is still out at the beach house. They head for his security car. Sue Lee is out there. Shooting starts from an automatic weapon in the woods across the street. Cal then says that this woman is deliberately inconsistent. You never know where she's going to be. He turns the key to the security car and it just clicks. Somehow she's done something to the starter. The driver's window then blows apart. There are more gun flashes. Shots crack from the pool. She's one clever person, but she's only human, says Kel. A shot cracks from the pool and hits Kel. Tissue and blood are sprayed over Mary Ellen. Kel is dead. Sue Lee begins to laugh and calls her by her childhood name, Mosey and keeps saying, and now he's dead, and now he's dead. Mary Ellen runs up to the third floor of the house, but it's a 45 foot drop to the ground. She holds onto the windowsill near the attic alcove. Sue Lee begins shooting up the house with the automatic weapon. Loud shots are fired downstairs as she calls out Mosey's name. Mary Ellen's hands are shaking. She sees a red glow from a smoldering stogie in the dark. She clutches Kel's handgun. Mary Ellen aims the gun. But Sue Lee says, you won't kill me because you don't have the nerve. She had that same cute smile. And then she tells Mary Ellen that Tony never did anything. She laughs as she puts in a new clip into the rifle. Mary Ellen fires and hits Sue Lee in the thigh. Sue Lee is slammed against the door and slides down to the floor. Mary Ellen then grabs the rifle. She backs out the sliders into the moist air. Tony had been guilty of no offense. The police sirens become louder now toward the beach house. But Sue Lee has survived the gunshot, grabs her, puts a rope around her neck. She's backlighted by the moon. Mary Ellen squirms and kicks. The stars are blurred and blood drips on her face. They splash into the water and the chlorine stings her abrasions. They both sink into the water, but then the rope loosens. Mary Ellen sees a dull pink glow, her eyes closed, and her throat feels like somebody has sliced it. She opens her eyes. The EMTs are taking her to the hospital. Hawkins arrives and looks down and tells her the children and the dog are being brought back from Annapolis. With Sue Lee and her brother dead and Kel sprawled out on the floor, she says that Kel scored the big one. After recovering, Mary Ellen is by the bay. The Osprey made another sweep around the bay. She sold the beach house. She thinks of Kel's spirit lingering in the air and regrets not having told her husband that she was wrong about Sue Lee.